Okay, I guess we started. One, go. So thank you for agreeing to come and talk, sharing these continuing attempts to understand how we come to understand how we talk to each other, I guess, hopefully not how we don't talk to each other, I hope not. I think this is part of Alice Mayer's project on dialoguing with dignity, and I hope with some decency today, uh, I hope we can agree to that. What I take from Alice's agenda, um, it has nothing to do with just entering another's world, but standing on the outside and looking at it uh, with some respect and, and some wonderment. I, I was listening this morning, maybe Neil was listening to, to a mystic talking, a wonderful mystic who I, I love and I don't understand a word he says. I, I literally can only visit his world and he's never liked my writing and I've never liked his and I like him very much and he likes me very much uh, for some reason that doesn't seem to work well with uh, certain parts of our electorate right now. We don't seem to be able to talk to each other at all. So what in the world is going on? So the question comes up, can I dialogue with someone who's different? Can I learn how they came to their beliefs? Can that be of interest to me? Can I be interested in how someone, there's a Buddhist here, a conservative here, a, an avowed Jew here, uh, uh, and I'm going to be here, assuming I'm allowed to be here. So uh, what usually happens is the arguments happen from top down. So we talk about our positions, and then we justify them by choosing newspaper articles and all kinds of stuff and evidence and reports and, and data. And we, we, he did this and he did, yeah. Uh, my hope was that if we do this from bottom up, we might be better off, but I don't know. Uh, so I see this as an experiment uh, in whether or not, if we look at how we came to where we are, perhaps from the beginning, from as early on as we can go, we might understand how we end up in these positions. So let me say from the beginning that none of us have any financial interest in this dialogue. Yeah. In fact, we don't know if we have any interest in this dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, uh, uh, no promises have been made, no guidelines have been given. There were a few people on the panel who reached out and I, I had nothing to say because I don't know where this goes. I really don't know. but. I'm hopeful that if you allow me to facilitate this, we'll move in the direction and learn about each other, you know, which is what you generally don't get on Facebook. You know, it's more like uh, talks about who your mother was with and how many times your mother was with that person. And, yeah, uh, uh, we don't have friendly talk with each other. There was a, the only thing was the announcement that suggested that we'd be exploring our own and other paths to an understanding of what it is that we value, of what we hold valuable. And perhaps in a second dialogue to explore how we got from there to our policy positions. Yeah? So in my thinking, it goes kind of like this somehow we develop a way of looking at the world and taking in the world and seeing the world. Yeah. And then we develop a kind of ethic and then we develop friends and between the ethics and the friends, we develop policy positions and then we tend to come back and justify them. I don't wanna go up to the, the a justification because that just means fighting. I would really like to know what it's like to be a Buddhist, 
I would like to know what it's like to be a conservative and how you come upon those values or your particular form of conservatism, which I know nothing at all about, Zyla. I know nothing. Um, and I'd like us to perhaps avoid um, the letters after our name and all of our many accomplishments and what new camera we bought and everything else. Just, uh, I'm, 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 I mean, we have four people and, and we've met in this space. And the question is, can we learn where we came from? Uh, my own view, by the way, is I've often said this to my grandchildren, uh, that there are those people who look at life as like a perfect origami sculpture. And I look at it as a bunch of people sitting around and pulling apart an origami structure and laying the, the paper out straight and looking for the message on that. So my hope is that we kind of unfold this and we find some message, uh, perhaps we'll see similarities and differences and differences and similarities that are really binding for us. So if it's okay, uh, I mean, I'll begin with my own self-description and wishes for the day. Uh, so I, I, I'm a baby boomer. I was the fourth child in a working class family. Uh, my father was a printer. My Hungarian mother was a housewife as they said in the 50s, an amateur artist. I was the only live birth after the war, so I have three older siblings. Uh, early years were spent upstairs from grandma and grandpa in Brooklyn. Grandpa was a religious leader. Uh, family was religious, some would say fanatical. Uh, we spoke lots of languages other than English, so I grew up in kind of a foreign country in some ways, but almost all the kids on the block spoke some other language. They were Italian kids and they were, were Jewish kids. And somehow we all learned to say, fuck you. Uh, uh, all of us learned that pretty early on. Um, and that was part of, of the life on the streets in Brooklyn. We, uh, my father was less religious, not a monster, but a soldier boy capable of very angry outbursts and violence towards his kids. I quickly, I think developed a sense that my family was a safe place and a place that had values. I was particularly interested in watching my grandfather who would have people in his, uh, I mean, this was one railroad flat over another. So it was in his front room, he had a kind of study and there were always people in there. There were all kinds of people, all colors and and all religions, although clearly the, the notion that my family and my religion were really good uh, was central uh, to my upbringing. Um, but I really came through with the idea, and I think, so by this time I'm six. Uh, I, my grandfather has taught me how to read a bunch of classical languages. Uh, I'm a smart little kid, but the sense I had was there was one way you treated everybody. And that's kind of where I would stop in my history when I'm about six. Uh, my wishes for today are very few. Uh, I'd like to be open. I'd like to learn about each of the three of you. I, I met Neil once. I haven't met either of, I met Neil briefly at a talk, uh, I think two years ago. And, and we've communicated over Facebook and that's my only contact. I know Alice a little better. Um, so I, I, I do hope that we stay within this model, but you've made no agreements and I will certainly not be keeping you in this model. Um, but I'd be interested in us looking at if our, our developments a fairly consonant. I, I would, uh, my preference is that people not cite uh, data, facts that we can or can't confirm. I don't know that they're relevant for us to get to know each other. 
I, and that's my only wish is is really to get to know you in a way that I I hope is loving and caring. Uh, hope to get to know each of you. So that's all I have to say. Would anyone else like to start? Yeah, well, I'm ready. I'm ready to go, and I just wanted to to go along with Howard on it. I stopped at six also. So, so um, I grew up on Long Island in a suburban household. Um, my parents moved there when I was about oh, six months old from uh, Brooklyn. So my older brother and sister were both born on, born in Brooklyn. And um, we were a family of five, a nuclear family. My father worked, my mother didn't, but she was involved in some um, activities outside, a lot of PTA work. She was a den mother for the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts, the Brownies. Um, at the age of two and a half, I had a terrible, terrible trauma. I witnessed my brother almost die. And I think I'm still in recovery from, recovering from that trauma. Um, and I think that trauma affected my family in myriads of ways, which we never addressed because no one ever really spoke about it and the effect and impact it had on, on the rest of us, not just my brother. I think that my family was not religious at all. We only went to temple on the holy days, uh, Yom Kippur and, uh, and uh, Rosh Hashanah, and we did the Seder thing. But other than that, there was no religiosity in the household. My father was an atheist. My mother was an agnostic. And I grew up with that as my uh, theological template. Um, my, I think that my ethical foundations are grounded in play. That, you know, I always feel that I was fortunate to have grown up in the 50s and the 60s when children were outside on the street playing without parental supervision. My mother would always say, get out of the house, no matter if it was snowing, raining, cold, and go play. But my problem was that um, I didn't really uh, get along with too many of the other boys in the neighborhood. So there was always a lot of, there was always a lot of uh, teasing and ridicule and, and uh, arguing and fighting. Um, but I think within all that, with all, within all that, um, there was a budding sense of what, what I like to say, and I heard it this morning, and I thought it was very effective, that we're all in this look, we're all in the same room together, and we're never alone. And even if you're having uh, um, a physical fight or an argument with somebody with the other kids in the block and they're chasing you down the block. It's all being done in the same room. It's all being done across time in the same room and everybody's being affected by it in many different ways. So, so that was the uh, groundwork for my ethical uh, growing up, figuring out how to get along even when you weren't getting along. And I think the same dynamic was playing out in my family where um, I think that there was some sense of family, but often that everyone was off in their own space. And um, um, so it was a sense of togetherness, but at the same time, I always felt very alone and very lost and very confused about what my place was in the family and uh, how to find it and how to discover it. So that brings me to about six also. So, um, and that's, I'll just leave it there. Who's next? I think it's Susan. Okay. <laughs> um, I was really interested in being part of this panel because this is something I've been thinking a lot about as I get older, um, how the trajectory of my life and the work that I've done has really been affected. It turns out really by my early education and I'm from New York and um, also a, a baby boomer. And my parents made the decision to send me to this school with this crazy name, Ethical Culture. And um, 
if for those of you who don't know too much uh, about it, ethical culture um, is a secular humanist movement. Um, I'm not going to quote that, you know, um, that and Wikipedia articles or whatever, but you know, it was started in the 1890s and, um, you know, it was started by a reform rabbi, but somebody who believed that, um, a moral life and an, an ethically informed life was really critical, but that it could exist outside of religion. And so it was deed, not creed. And, um, a very, it started with the golden rule, you know, um, but it went to the next step, which was that you don't just believe these things, you do. You do good work. And that um, it was important not, it was important to start out by being, quote, a good person, but it was really important to do good work. And, um, and also the, the movement really felt that the education of young people was was very very important, and so the, this school was founded, um, uh, really. And and we we had weekly ethics classes growing up, and uh, you know we were learning we were learning I guess what they call critical thinking now. You know how to make decisions, ethically informed decisions, and you know we focused a lot on injustice and I have just crazy memories. For example, in third grade, we, we learned about migrant workers. Now I'm sorry, <laughs> how many third graders in the fifties and sixties were, were studying, um, you know, migrant workers. And now it kind of seems like no big deal, but in those days it wasn't exactly the Aussie and Harriet, um, you know, view of, uh, of education, we had an assembly in sixth grade where Stokely Carmichael came to talk about SNCC and the Freedom Riders. Um, yeah, and uh, the you know our cl my classmates' parents were one was a Freedom Rider. Uh, they were labor lawyers. You know, they were people who were very involved, especially in New York, in. Um, uh, political and social um, uh, movements and issues. And, um, you know, we sang our school song was like, deeds, not words, shall thunder. And uh, so, so that was the atmosphere we grew up with. There were also a lot of teachers and staff who were Holocaust survivors. So we had a pretty good sense of what was evil. And, um, but then as I came into high school, um, you know, we did, we worked as in tutoring programs. A lot of my friends were in active in the anti-war movement. And I even had, I had a friend who at 17 was trained as a draft counselor by our American history teacher. So, um, that was the environment. And, uh, say that you're far ahead of your I'm going to stop. Age. So I'm going to stop at age 17. Oh, 17. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm taking you through high school. You're still far mature. The, you're still <laughs> mature. Yeah. I was liking the story. <laughs> I like the story and I hope we all get there, but, but so yeah. far. That was childhood. So, uh, My childhood lasted longer than age six, you know, so... <laughs> Go ahead, Tyler. I, I think my child had lasted till 43, yeah. but um, I will stop somewhere younger. So I grew up on a ranch and a lumber mill in southeastern Idaho. Um, a lot of my the, the direct people that were spending the most amount of time with me were like my grandpa, who for reference was uh, 45 years old when my mom was born. So I had an older grandpa, my grandmother, who actually just died last year at the age of 95, was born in 1925. And I think a lot of the influence and the things that have, that shaped who I am came from, for lack of a better term, the 1800s, okay? And I say that because 
there, my great grandpa that I knew briefly when I was born was born in the early 1800s. And I, I'm the descendants of pioneers. So um, I, I guess I would say I feel culturally very attached to the West and pioneers and that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to go to 17 if that's all right, because not a lot happened. Um, sorry, as you guys are talking, it's like this cascade of things going through my brain that I want to reference. So I'm trying to put it all together. One thing that I've seen that's interesting for me is wow. as my life moved forward, I feel like I've got a foot in two realms, a foot in the urban, a foot in the city, a foot in the military, and a foot in the bush hippie. So you're going to see me come back to that a little bit. Um, so this this early portion of my life is all urban and all rural, and it's 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 all affected by a super small community. You guys have talked a little bit about being in New York City and millions and millions of people. There was maybe 300 people that I knew before the age of eight, because that's all the people that were in my local community. The place that I lived was about 15 miles north of a town of 300 people, which is another maybe 15, 20 miles north of a town of 3,000 people, which is hours in any direction from any town with no more than 100,000 people, okay? So I, I, I really grew out in, the, uh, out in the middle of nowhere. And later on in life, I noticed the relationships that I developed when I was younger, we had to learn how to get along. It's not like you can just trade your friend in for another friend. You only got one friend. And I, I, I've, later on as I've grown up in life, I've seen that in a positive and a negative way is a major difference that I see between the two things. Anyways, without, without kind of getting into urban versus rural, I'm gonna move forward a little bit. Um, we moved, we, we lost the farm to shorten that. Um, there was a, the way farms function is they basically, they get a loan every year, they buy the equipment they need. Uh, if, if you don't pull in what you need, then you lose the farm. And what happened was my grandfather died and the, the farm was split up between my grandma, my uncle and everybody. So we moved and I went straight to Phoenix, Arizona. So going from the ruralest of rural to the cityest of city was a hard shock for me. And I and I, I went to school in a small school where there was kids dying in front of the school from gangs or from getting run over. And that's why I say I went from one foot in the rural to one foot in the city. We were there for about six months. We moved to St. George, Utah for a year. And then I come back to a town in southeastern Idaho again, that 3,000 people town. And that's where I moved forward to the age of 17. Um, I joined the military at the age of 17 and kind of kind of uh, all of my life, the way that I view things is all affected by that. Um, you had mentioned working, Susan had mentioned working with a lot of the immigrants or uh, uh, migrant workers. Um, you reminded me of my childhood. I spent a lot of time moving pipe, branding cattle, fixing fences with migrant workers. And as far as the the, you, you guys have both talked about the different ethnic groups that you were around. I was around a lot of Hispanic people and a lot of Native American people. I have Native American blood and relatives. And the early part of my life, that was it. There was no North versus South on my radar. I didn't know what the KKK was until I got in the military. And a, a Black friend of mine taught me about that. So it's kind of a basis for reference. And it was a real, it was really interesting for me to be this outsider looking in on something that hadn't been part of my life up until then. The only conflict I could really say would be you know, um, the, the Wild West conflicts that we, we would all talk about. So um, without going past 17, I'm trying to stop there, see if I've answered your question. Without going past 17, a lot of my ideology, my social norms, a lot of the way that I look at things has been developed because of a really old Western way of looking at things, of uh, open the door for women, women go first, um, chivalry, not in a negative way, but just because that's the right thing to do. You do the right thing because that's the right thing to do. And I'm certain that's why I'm primarily, but not completely conservative. I, I'm, I'm certain that's, that's why I've kind of gone in that direction. 
Um, ask me some questions. <laughs> I mean, do you think that's really different? Uh, I'm, I'm, do you think that the, the chivalry wasn't there? No, I think it's, I think that chivalry existed everywhere, but it's, for lack of a better term, been under attack because it's been misinterpreted. And I remember, okay, so Neil talked about being a baby boomer. I'm Generation X, right? So I, my childhood, you see this tooth right here? I broke that thing out of my face riding my BMX down a hill and hitting a ramp that was too big, okay? So we, my mom would say, go out, don't come back until it's dark. But if you don't come back it's when it's dark, you're going to get your butt swatted. And that was my childhood. And I remember the one time that I didn't come back until it was dark. And it was because I went into a friend's house and we were playing with something. And I didn't see it get dark outside. And my parents freaked out and come and found me. And it was a semi-traumatic experience. But I had that very grow up, grow, grow up in the outdoors experience. And I still cherish all of that. But also around the last half of of my high school, that's when we, that's when the Nintendo came out, right? I played the Atari, but that didn't have the grip on society like the Nintendo did. And I played Mario Brothers till I got Nintendo thumb. And it was a super addictive game. And then I realized that I don't want to be shut in the house all the time. And I started hiking and backpacking and doing more outdoor related things while all of my other friends, not all of them, started playing Police Quest on that old uh, 486 uh, computer that was just you know, couldn't compete with modern day calculator. But I saw that division happen and I saw the societal move to indoors from outdoors. And I, I can kind of, I can kind of empathize with that. So do I think we're different? I, th I think that all areas had chivalry. I think the chivalry is still important. I think that it's been under attack because of a misunderstanding of what it is. A, a fair misunderstanding, but a misunderstanding. Does that kind of answer your question? Can I, can I just, can I jump in? Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Are we jumping in? Um, yeah, okay, please. Uh, I just want to say, you know, growing up in a uh, semi-urban environment, which I left when I was 15 to, to, to move into a, a, a very urban environment, New Haven, Connecticut, in, in a time of uh, great civil unrest in this country. But I, I just want to go back to the chivalry um, idea that um, I, I learned from my father at a very early age that you walked on the outside when you're walking down the street with a woman, that you opened the door for everyone. And my father was, you know, I, I guess on the, he was a very fair man in the sense of how he treated um, um, women in, in that respect. And he passed that along to his sons. And so, you know, so I don't, I don't think that, um, so I just wonder that there's a something, a common ground that we found or that you and I have found already in respect to, you know, you growing up in a very rural environment, learning about chivalry and, and I'm growing up in a, in a bedroom community of New York City, my father um, commuting into the city every day, coming back, we went to Broadway shows, museums, and out to dinners, and there were lots of people around all the time. We didn't have a lot of um, uh, variance in races where I grew up. There was one uh, a black family across the street, and my parents encouraged us to play with their children, to be involved with them. And they were always invited to all our, you know, my bar mitzvah and my brother's bar mitzvah and things like that. So, so but that was the only, until I moved to New Haven, but that whole notion of, I mean, there was something else that Tyler mentioned also, but I, I, I've lost the track that that was a similarity also, but that notion of, of common civility, uh, the, the, the foundations of, of developing an ethical sense that you treat all people fairly, that you treat uh, people of different, you know, gender uh, fairly. We didn't have back in the fifties, no, there wasn't maybe, probably not any discussion about homosexuality or, or LGBT community at that time. But, but you know, so my parents, my mother was, was very involved in the civil rights movement and, the, and running, you know, the Kennedy election and, and all the assassinations that ensued. So that was very much a part of my milieu growing up also going back to, I'm sorry, I wasn't here for the introduction. So I don't know all everyone's names. But, um, but so 
there's something common, there's some common ground here that I think we're already stumbling on. Yeah, I mean, is there uncommon ground outside of the fact that I think you know, folks growing up, we have three people born in the 40s, I guess, or, or, or Neil early 50s. I just, I just made it. I just made it. <laughs> I, I, I mean, we're born a while ago and you're born later. And, 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 and though when it comes to the golden rule and the kind of division of late, between men and women, I wonder if they were different. I don't think so. Uh, I think on, uh, I mean, maybe there was more of a comfort with gender roles being blurred a little bit. Uh, uh, but women in the 50s were not, uh, you know, were not running around. Or anyway, there weren't a lot of women running around as far as I knew, and we were all we were all in the soup together. So you worked with Hispanic people, and you had neighbor. I certainly lived in a mixed neighborhood, uh, where the only thing we had in common was that we were all poor. We had that in, one kid down the street had an uncle who owned a toy shop. He seemed rich because he got toys, but. Uh, the rest of us, I mean, everybody worked. They worked for the uh, uh, the IRT, you know, the, uh, the subway system or something. One was a hack. One was a painter. Uh, um, everybody worked. My father was a printer. Uh, and, and so far, I don't see a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, family, I assume, was important for us all in some way. Yeah, and, and we all came to be, and perhaps that's the next thing. Uh, I'm not, what did you think of your family? Uh, I, I, how was your family structured? Was it a, uh, I, I, was it a patriarchy? I mean, was the father ruling the roost? I mean, were there other differences? Uh, were sisters treated uh, differently than brothers? Was everybody expected to work? Uh, so I wonder if you talk about those years from a personal level, what was the structure of what was normal? And I think family defines what's normal for us, as crazy as our families might have been. It, it, it defines what it is. I mean, what is normal? And if you're willing, for me, it, it was a really conventional family. My father uh, woke up around four, and I do too. I write in the morning. My father, uh, uh, my father went to work in the morning, uh, 4.30. Mom made breakfast for him at four o'clock in the morning. I think she'd sometimes take a cat nap afterwards, but he was up every morning at 4.30. Mom stayed at home and we had a fairly normal home. We were sent off to seminary, usually in our early adolescence, the boys. The girls stayed home and we were sent off to live and stuff, the religious studies. That's what we did all day. And I did that all through uh, my adolescence. And again, it was always reconfirmed two things and, and they contradicted each other. One was that our family and our community was, uh, uh, was good. It was not the only good, but it was good. And that there were tensions with other communities and that was problematic, not based on race, uh, usually based on religion. Uh, so racially, we were integrated. Religiously, we led a pretty, a fairly isolated life. Uh, so that's what happened to me uh, in, in the years before my wife got a hold of me. In 1965, we got married. So, but the years till then, family, religion, studies, um, and a real belief that everybody was created equal. You know, outside of that, you worked, you paid your own way, you paid your own bills, you didn't cheat, you didn't even cheat the IRS. You were lucky to be paying taxes, I remember my father saying. Whoever thought you'd make enough money to pay taxes is what 
pay the taxes. <laughs> if you can afford it, it's great. Who would like to carry us through? through my, family was, my family was pretty conventional, you know, traditional nuclear family. I had a uh, mom, dad, a uh, younger brother. My dad worked, my mother didn't work. Um, but one of the things that I, I, thinking about now that I, I treasure that I don't think we have so much now, or uh, it was the extended family. And, um, you know, uh, grandparents and my uh, dad had a big family, a lot of siblings. And so I had a lot of cousins, all, you know, close in age. We traveled together, which meant getting in the car and going to, you know, what is now the suburbs, but at that time was like the woods and going, going to a lake on a Saturday. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and, and even kind of going back, I remember my dad, he would, when, uh, my parents would take us on these kind of road trips back to Brooklyn, right. To see where they had grown up. And one day my dad took us to the house he'd grown up in, uh, I think in Midwood, and he pointed to all the windows and he said, you know, his grandmother lived in that room and aunt so-and-so lived in that room and cousin this one. And um, so we were sort of at the tail end of that, but um, you know, that hasn't, that hasn't happened in my generation. And that, you know, I married later than my cousins. My kids are a lot younger. They don't have cousins. Um, and, you know, so I think that's something that I, I treasure, you know, really, really treasure those memories and, um, you know, and I have a strong sense of sort of being part of a community and, and kind of a civic glue. And, um, and I think some of it really comes from that family, that extended family feeling. I was always very ambivalent about family, and I, and I remained so. We had a, uh, like I said before, it was a typical nuclear family growing up. And, um, you know, there was the extended family, but I never really felt comfortable when we'd go to the holidays at family's houses. And, um, you know, most of my cousins were younger than me, much younger than my sister, younger than my brother. And uh, there was very little, interaction between the cousins. You know, I just remember going to my father's sister's house for, for Seder, her sons, one would go visit his friends and the other one would stay in his room. And so my brother and sister and my sister would, you know, so we were all just on our own in those situations. So I never really felt comfortable or, or that there was that strong cohesive sense of family uh, around me and, and at home, and at home in the house, like I said before, it was, it was kind of the same way that we were all uh, in our disparate, separate lives. My sister had her own room. My brother and I shared a room. My father built all the furniture in our room with my grandfather. He was very handy with his hands. He was an accountant. And he always said, pay your taxes too, because if you don't, eventually everyone gets caught in the end, no matter how long it takes, you get audited. And, uh, but, but so, I, I, I wasn't, not, not, wasn't allowed in his workroom, but I was not, um, I was kind of persuaded not to be so involved with hammers and saws and things like that because I could never hit a nail straight on the head or saw a straight line. And um, so my brother was always very good at that. And my father never played catch with me, but he played catch with my sister who had a first baseman's glove can you imagine 1955 or something like that? A first baseman's glove, whoever, I didn't even know what that was, but she had one. And my brother, like I said, was in the Boy Scouts and the Cub Scouts and I refused. I refused the Little League. I refused everything. I, I refused doing homework. I just don't. So that was kind of my growing up. But at the same time, you know, I, I grew up in this nice, comfortable suburban environment, you know, kind of middle class you know, the, with the two cars and the backyard and the, my father was great when it came to, um, um, my father loved, his experience as a child was going up to uh, uh, the Catskills uh, every summer. 
and hanging out with, with his friends, running around in the woods, the Boy Scouts going on hikes and things like that. So he would literally go out, go out and get trees and rocks from the country and bring them back and plant them around our suburban Valley Stream household. So we had birch trees and blue spruce and apple trees in our very little quarter acre. I don't even know if it was a quarter acre, but you know, property and so developing this, but it was always all about him, what he wanted and what he needed. And we never had air conditioning in the house because he felt like planting shrubbery around the house and ivy would keep the house cool in the summertime, you know, fat chance, right? But anyway, but, anyway, so, but it was that kind of uh, growing up experience that, um, that, and I think my sister might agree and my brother would have agreed he died about 30 years ago, um, but um, that we were all kind of on our own you know, find, trying to make our own way, figure things out. We, uh, my brother and sister worked in high school. I didn't, I wouldn't, no way. And, um, you know, because I just wanted to play and I just wanted to, um, at the same time, I wanted to be out of the house. It was very hard to get me to leave the house in a, in a, um, in a bigger picture, I, you know. So if my brother went away to camp, I would not go away to camp. If my mother sent me up to the country to be with my grandparents in the Catskills, I just hated it and I just wanted to get back home as fast as possible. Because I was so afraid of losing home that I clung to it. I clung to it and, and yet what I was clinging to was not providing me with the sense of security that, that I was looking for. Hmm. Well, um, I had a Childhood, sorry, I'm trying to get, make sure I'm not yelling. I had a childhood very similar to Susan's when we lived on the ranch. My grandma lived across the street. My cousin lived up the road. Um, my dad's family had, I can't remember, eight or nine children. So there's always cousins and aunts and uncles and all these people all the time. And that was the core of my, my, my best buddy was my cousin. He was a adopted black Indian kid. And that's who I hung out with the majority of the time. Um, he died when he was 25 from uh, childhood diabetes. Uh, diabetes. Um, so it was a bit of a shock for me to go from a extremely thick family structure. Everyone around me was family. If we weren't with my dad's family, we were with my mom's family. If we weren't there, we were with grandpa's family or someone were all, always with some sort of family or because of the nature of this little town that I'm from, some sort of extended family or friends of family or people, you know, everyone in this valley, I would call family, even though they're not related to all of them, I would see the neighbors as my family because it's the one of four houses on the street, right? So when I moved to Phoenix, Arizona, I felt, mm. <laughs> I felt like a Borg detached from the Borg, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you want to use my Star Trek reference. Um, I was confined to this one house with a backyard with a high high fence. I was afraid to walk to the end of the end of the block without getting lost. Um, I saw crazy amounts of crime and just a lot of bad stuff happen there in uh, in Arizona that I hadn't been before. It was just stuff that was on TV. It wasn't part of my reality. And then um, that obviously changed a lot of the way that I looked at things. And then as we moved back to Idaho, where I was went from third grade through high school, I felt like I was coming home. And I think that's part of the reason why I like the mountains so much. And I like the area that I'm from. So I would just like to just to jump in quickly. My brother died of, uh, from juvenile diabetes when he was 35. That makes sense. And, and I was in the room when he and I and I was the one who found him uh, when he was dead. And uh, I had a similar experience moving from, like I said, from a suburban environment to inner city New Haven, Connecticut, going to a high school where there were where there was um, fights and uh, violence, you know, um, and riots. So, so that's another. I'm just loving. I'm just loving hearing all these things come out, which seem like small details that are connecting us in, I think, really big ways. And and actually more similar than I would expect, although I, I don't know how we responded to what I remember moving with my kids and they were six and seven, it was 1974, seven and eight or something like that. 
And we moved from a town of 75 people in New Hampshire on a beaver pond where we were living to Philadelphia. And there were more people on the bus than there were in our town. They had to change the sign when uh, uh, we left the town. And I came to Philadelphia and uh, my first experience was kind of interesting, it was an accident. Uh, so uh, we moved ourselves, uh, I, I drove a moving truck down from, you know, and a friend came over to help us unpack. Before the friend came over, our neighbors, our neighbors brought us a pie. Well, great to have you in the neighborhood. And then uh, my friend came over that afternoon and helped us unload and he's from Baltimore and he uh, came up and helped. Uh, the next morning they had shoveled shit on my front door because he was black. Uh, and, and my response was at that moment to feel a turn towards liberalism. I had been kind of politically neutral kind of inert. Uh, I was a graduate student in mathematics and uh, a doctoral student for a long time, uh, had kids, I was a father. I, I'm, I was doing all these things that human beings do and I wasn't involved at all in political thinking, not at all. I was married, I was doing all of the conventional things that people do. We had a third child shortly after God thing here uh, and, and that was kind of cool and uh, and she was a girl I was really happy about that uh, I had enough with sons actually uh, uh, but my values actually moved in the direction at that point towards liberalism I would say uh, I wasn't involved in a lot of anti-war movement I would attend but I was I was a nerd doing mathematics, you know, and publisher in mathematics, and that's what I, I was doing. But I think it was around then that I hardened that one incident. I wonder if there are incidents in your lives that have kind of moved you, because I think we begin the same. Susan mentioned the golden rule. Matthew 5, Leviticus 19. It's more or less the same rule. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount and the uh, uh, chapter in Leviticus that says, holy shall you be, and the, it goes on and lists the, uh, 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 the golden rule in one form or another, treating people as you want to be treated and not doing to people what you don't want to be done to you. There are many versions of it, but they, I, I think, all pretty much say the same thing. And we all have that as a foundation, at some point, we move in one direction or another. And I'm wondering, how does that happen? Mm. I, I'm, I, why didn't I become at that point a conservative and say, well, I'm in Philadelphia and it's violent. I, I was here to run a school for inner city kids, violent inner city kids. Um, and that must have had an impact on me too, because. There was an all white school until I integrated it. I suspect I integrated it because I was still pissed off about that neighbor of mine shoveling shit because my friend who was the son of the minister is a much holier person than I am. I came to help a friend. I was, uh, but uh, my, were there moments that moved you in one direction or another? Anyone? I have yeah. some stuff. All right, go ahead. Go ahead, Neil. Oh, all right, so I, you know, I, I don't know if I can pin it down, you know, to a specific moment, because I, 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 a lot of things, a lot of moments are coming up. And, and I, think, I think my move towards liberalism and progressivism started very early in life. And I often wonder if my brother's accident, my brother was, when my mother sent us out to play, I was two and a half, my brother was five. And it was a beautiful summer day. I'm, I'm making this up because who remembers what happens to them at two and a half? But uh, but I but but it's a but it's a major moment time in life. You know, it's when you're just starting to uh, to uh, explore the world. It's uh, you know you're leaving leaving the house in a sense. And and so my brother crossed the street. Uh oh, 
verboten, right, to cross the street. And there was a uh, some men working on working on the street, and a uh, a crane came along, and it um, knocked a high intent a high an electrical wire down, and my brother got caught in that. And I witnessed that at two and a half. I mean, you know, and I had to run back to the house crying, crying his name to my mother, you know. And, and so this, I think this traumatic event in some ways set me on the path towards being more progressive and liberal in, in the sense of, of, of um, I, know, I, I know there's, there's, there's a point here in a sense that the world is a dangerous place, and if we don't look out for each other, if we don't look out for, for each other, bad things are going to happen. And that, in turn, for, uh, you know, later in life uh, became, you know, what attracted me to the civil rights movement, not so much later, to the civil rights movement and to the anti-war movement, was that I felt that, that you know, African Americans at that time were, were suffering from the same kind of trauma that my brother and I suffered from that from that accident, you know, we were, uh, you know, they were constantly being electrocuted by our society, and um, you know, shocked all the time by uh, the high, you know, by things from a high falling down on their heads, and without them having any anything to do with it, you know, just merely by coincidence and accident. And the same thing happened, you know, with and that just grew into my involvement with the anti-war movement and civil rights movement. But at the same time, it also um, had an, uh, another um, uh, impact on me. It, it, it sent me on, off onto a, a, a 10 year battle with drugs and alcohol as a way to um, uh, dull the, the trauma. Because I always felt like all of these things, whether they were bigger things from the external world or what was happening in my smaller internal world, my family, were just this persistent ongoing one trauma after another, whether it was happening to me personally or happening to African Americans or Native Americans or Vietnamese or Cambodians. It was just like, I just couldn't understand why, going back to what Howard was saying, why you learn in Hebrew school all about the golden rule, do unto other, you know, we all have to live in this world. And people were just doing horrible, terrible things to each other all the time. And how, how do you balance that out? How do you... Uh, um, make sense of that in the world. And, and I just, and for me, I just felt the, the most, the most, the best way for me to do that was to march and to protest and to um, be involved. And later in life, just quickly, when I found myself, I uh, became a, uh, a New York City school teacher and I worked in, in schools that needed to be integrated the other way than the way Howard integrated schools that were totally black Kids from, from poor neighborhoods, um, fighting drugs, you know, growing up in houses where their brothers or cousins were shot, or they themselves had seen violent crimes. So I, I could never understand um, how anybody could um, not want to help. I agree. Yeah. So let me I, try to distill my train of thought down into something that makes sense. Um, that grandpa that I talked about earlier that was a lot older than me, he, uh, he was an old grandpa. That's a good way to put it. Um, I spent a lot of time fishing with him because I was a hyper kid and my parents needed a break. <laughs> so um, he, if I remember correctly, he was born in 1917, which means he spent time in the Great Depression. And a lot of his ways of looking at the world were very conservative. He was also a Democrat. That's how he voted. And, and the that that was his ideology and at the time i would have matched it and i believe that if you look at the definition of a traditional liberal it's really close to the modern day definition of a of a conservative maybe not republican but a conservative so i would definitely call myself um mostly traditionally liberal and for a lot of the same reasons that you guys are identifying right now because you got to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Um, we talked a minute ago about uh, the guys that I worked with in the field. So when I was on a ranch, um, I'd move pipe with a lot of the Hispanic kids. I don't know that any of them were there legally. I didn't care. They're my buddies that we worked with on the ranch. Um, they're just 
the other people. There, there, there was, I, I guess what I'm saying is, whenever I talk with people from large cities, they talk about the divisions of ethnic groups. And it's, I get it, but it's weird to me, if that makes sense. Because mm -hmm. having Native American cousin, obviously all my, my relatives are mostly white. Um, I am actually, let me back up a little bit. I had a Native American great, great, great grandma all of our, all of my relatives looked like that until my grandma, my dad has black hair, blue eyes, married a Scandinavian lady and you get this. So I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot of, of mix and that just seemed normal to me. And I couldn't, I, I didn't ever under, under, I didn't understand why people would care what ethnic group that you were from. It, for me, it was always more, are you a good person? And I recognize the difference between money. I mean, money is a form of privilege that exists and I, we, I saw that we had the rich kids growing up and we had the poor kids I got along with the poor kids because they were more fun <laughs> that's just kind of how it went but um, I did want to address just so you will kind of understand where I'm coming from I saw a total of two black kids in my life before the age of 17 one of them was a neighbor kid that was adopted he was a cool little kid I said hi to him a couple times he was maybe five when I was 14 so it's not like I was hanging out with him I was nice to him because he was a child. That's all that really mattered to me. He's, he's a little kid, so I was nice to him. And if he said hi, I said hi, and that was about it. Uh, the other guy that I met was a martial arts instructor. I did martial arts almost religiously from the age of eight forward because of my experiences in Phoenix. Um, I think, Neil, what you were talking about, the act of moving from a safe place to a violent place creates a little bit of PTSD. Having been in multiple war zones, I get it. And I'm glad I was prepared for it by that experience. Um, so moving forward to the, the martial arts, when I was 17, we had a martial arts instructor named Rodney come from Maryland, who's a black kid. I was excited because he was a third degree black belt. I didn't care about anything else. He came back and taught us. And he, I remember it was funny because the day he was teaching us, he said, I'm, I'm afraid of coming to Idaho because the KKK might get me. And I was like, oh, cool, what's that? And I was just innocent, stupid question. I had no clue what the KKK was. And he taught me what it was and told me about it. And I was like, well, what a bunch of jerks. And, I, and he was surprised that not only had I never heard of this, well, basically just surprised I'd never heard of the KKK. And it was because there's a huge difference between the dinky little, as I now having been in law enforcement know, Aryan Nation that was up in Northern Idaho and then there's a big desert in the middle, and then there's south, southern, south, and southeastern Idaho might as well be a different state. There's a large separation. So why would I be exposed to something like that? It, it's kind of like the ocean. I've just never seen it because I've never been there. Does that make sense? So you guys talk about... I mean, I'm, we have the same thing in Pennsylvania. In With the Quakers, right? Large, no, no, there's a large posse coming up this uh, a group that is in the middle of the state. There are KKK groups in the middle of the state. And then you have Philadelphia and Pennsylvania and some other small towns. And that's true in New York. It's true in Vermont. Yeah. There are uh, white nationalists all over, but I don't think any of us are white nationalists. No. <laughs> uh, that's not a value that we have developed. That, that is none of us came to believe that somehow being white really privileged us in the sense of justifying any privileges that might accrue to us because we're white. We all believed that everybody was human. I, I agree. And the reason that I'm bringing that up is because you say that experience that was negative pushed you towards liberalism. I would say the same thing using the word conservatism, but talking about the same thing. And if you'll give me about one minute, I've long had a hypothesis that the whole societal breakdown, the whole reason there's flare-ups on, on Facebook and all of this is because an idea is formulated in your mind. You change that idea into words based on the, the way that you understand the definitions of those words. And then you spit it out into the ether. Then someone receives that message through the window of their biases, which has paint all over it. Maybe for me and Neil, the experience of going from an urban area to a violent area, there's some paint on that window and there's try as hard as we may, 
it's that message has to go through that filter or that bias before we can receive it. Then we take the words that that person has sent with the definitions that they've used and we put our own definitions onto whatever those words are. And then we receive that message. And I think the massive biggest issue always is I said something, you heard something different. You said something, I heard something different. And going back to Susan, whenever I get into any conversation like that, if I'm actually patient and tolerant enough to sit down and really want to get to the bottom of it, I always start with the critical analysis tools of defining your terms first. So that I know that if we're talking about racism, and we both call it racism, we're talking about the same thing. Or, and when I explain this, I usually say, if you talk about abortion and one person's talking about the day after pill, the other person's talking about partial birth abortion, two oh. different words, two completely different meanings shouldn't even be in the same sentence. The problem is I throw that word out, you hear something, you hear what you wanna hear. And once we start thinking about that and we see it and we realize that everyone has struggles, everyone has problems, everyone, for the most part, with the exception of, I will say, truly sociopathic people, everyone loves. And when we understand that and we take the patience to say, hey, what happened to you? And what do you mean by racism or abortion or whatever words that we're talking about? And why do you think that? Then we start to understand the people. And that's why I am trying to share with you guys the fact that I didn't have any exposure to Black anything until boot camp. Now, when I went to boot camp, I had something uh, do you think you're seen as a racist here i'm sorry no i don't i don't uh, I, I, we all agree we are yeah. are identical as far yes. as i know so far i've not heard any distinctions made that would separate what you're presenting tyler or what susan's presenting or or what neil as a buddhist is presenting uh, I, I, I'm not hearing any distinctions. Uh, I agree. I, I don't think that anyone sees me as a racist. What I'm trying to explain is, I, I'm trying to point out the similarities by identifying the differences, if that makes sense. Like Neil's talked about um, walking in um, civil rights parades. I watch it on TV. I have no experience with that whatsoever. And that's not me trying to, I, I'm not trying to defend myself from an attack. I don't think anyone's attacked me at all. I'm obviously not racist, right? What I'm trying to say is that my perspective is that of something that's completely outside of that realm, but we still came to the same conclusions based on similar experiences. Does that make sense? I think what you started off saying was something that struck me, struck a bell in my head, mm -hmm. was that some of the most, some of the most, mm -hmm. uh, what's the word um, I'm looking for? Anyway, so, some of the most heated discussions I've had on Facebook have been with my own liberal and progressive Facebook friends. Mm -hmm. When I would say something, something s simple like, you know, yes, so and so Republican is this kind of person, but. I would, I need to know more about this person, like what, why we're here talking, you know, why, how did that person develop to become this person? And people would fly at me, says, we are wasting your time. Why bother? They don't want to listen to you. And I'd say, well, are you listening to them? Well, why would I want to listen to them when their ideas are so antithetical to mine? So, so where I thought you were going and maybe, you know, like I'm a little lost in there was that was that uh, you know we all started off in life, all four of us, with with some common things, and we talked about the golden rule, and and and, and how did this failure to be able to talk to each other? How did it how did it take root and become the way we are as a people in this country and and as individuals, even with friends and family? How do we get to this point where? As you were saying, Tyler, where, you know, this is a cup and that's a cup and that's all it's ever, ever going to be. You know, don't tell me it's something other than what I believe it is. You know, if you're not, if you're not a Catholic, if you're not a Buddhist, if you're not a Democrat, you're not, don't talk to me. I don't want to hear it. You're just wrong. 
So, so you know, so this is something that really concerns me. I remember, you know, working in, in, in public schools here in New York and being surrounded, just surrounded by black and Hispanic and, and, and boys and kids from, from uh, uh, Palestine and Yemen and just hearing their cries all the time, just hearing them crying all the time. We are not treated right. We are not treated properly. We are, we are not even close to being second class citizens. And in an education system that's run by white people, you know, run, you got to learn this, you got to learn that. Oh, go to Mr. Freeman in the suspense room because you can't sit still in the classroom because you can't because you you stand up and you're having a fight with so and so. Nobody taking the time, nobody taking the time or the effort to say, well, let's forget about algebra for a year and let's talk about Susan was talking. About. Let's teach ethics. Let's teach some ethical culture. Let's teach civics. Let's get these kids together and let them talk. Let them talk about their similarities and the differences. So, so, but we've become so entrenched that even when you see, even when I'm sitting with friends on Facebook and I just say something like, you know, yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a real evil person, but he wasn't born that way or she wasn't born that way. Something happened. How do we become entrenched? How yeah. did that happen? And and thinking of Freud, uh, Freud said that women have a different kind of conscience than men, that it's never separated from feelings. Uh, so Susan, you've been listening hmm. to all of these and gradually men talk. What do you think is going on? Because <laughs> from my perspective, what we're looking at is three <laughs> values that are essentially comparable. Before we go to policies, assuming yeah. we agree to meet next time, having killed each other off, uh, <laughs> what do you think is going on? Well, I actually, I, I'm interested in two, two different things. First, uh, in terms of how did we get so entrenched, I think one thing I would say is that words have changed their meanings and mm -hmm. have become laden. So, mm -hmm. for example, we started or at the beginning talking about chivalry. And, right. you know, I was a very dogmatic feminist. I came of age in the 70s. And um, as I'm, and nobody was allowed to hold the door for me. But, <laughs> you know, now that I'm an old lady, I mean, what I see really is there are ways in which people can act with each other that just reflect good manners, right? Mm -hmm. And respect. And also there are these things that you do so that two people don't go through the door at the same time. But that ultimately uh, it's about, you know, um, treating people well. And I'm very, very happy to be, um, you know, I, I love having somebody on the outside. Um, but that doesn't negate the fact that I, professionally experienced sexual harassment. I mean, I, you know, had experiences to really justify um, my feminism, but I think this word chivalry, right? And, uh, and similarly, I would say, Tyler, when you began to bring up abortion, which I don't think anybody here really wants to get into the weeds on, but what, uh, but what I have thought for a long time is, what happened to the term family values and uh, mm. and and uh, being pro life? Mm -hmm. You know, aren't we all pro life? Why did one group grab that and make it theirs and use it as a weapon when really I am I'm very pro life and I am also for family values. You know, and so going back to Phyllis Schlafly or whoever, you know, grab family values and use it as a weapon. So I think that that's a lot of it. And I think that looking at language and looking at the way we communicate and trying to just get to some basics of how do we treat each other, you know, and um, an expression, by the way, uh, of, uh, uh, of right to life and such things. Uh, it, it is really interesting because I, I, I begin to think that somehow we begin identifying with expressions. On the left, for instance, there's the notion of the slippery slope. So nobody was willing to negotiate at all on late-term abortions, yeah, because of a slippery slope. And everybody got caught up 
into the right to choose, even though I don't think chances are any of us believes a woman has a right to choose after viability. Uh, I, I suspect we, uh, <laughs> that, that in eight months. How about when the baby is really about- I don't talk about it, <laughs> <laughs> you know? But I am interested in the idea that I could sit with somebody and um, and talk about the the implications. My very first job, I will tell you, I was a Planned Parenthood volunteer in college, and I um, worked in the teen clinics. And this was in the early '70s, and it was during Roe v. Wade. So um, I. I can sit with somebody and I'm and and be very generous about talking about um, all the options and all the or, or alternatives and and what you believe and 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 I'm happy to to have those conversations and uh, you know they that can exist and you can also make your own decision. Uh, I'm wondering if we choose labels and then we get stuck. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because the values seem, and that's one of the things that interested me. The United States is a pretty homogeneous country. Well over 90% of the people come from Abrahamic religions. We all have more or less the same moral code, more or less. Uh, if you read the Quran, the New Testament, the Old Testament, uh, and look at religious life in any of these three communities, you have something very similar. You have observance of things like Sabbaths, whether they're Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. You have a respect for God. Uh, and, uh, and yet, we seem so fragmented. I wonder if we just don't put on identities at some point. And that's what I'm trying to see. Is there a place where we really say, uh, well, I'm a liberal. Or I'm a conservative, and I'll fight to the death to, uh, to support those policies. The values are the same, I guess. It's a matter of it's a matter of life and death. It seems to me it comes down to just over over these labels. I mean, it's like you know belief systems themselves. You know, it's just it's how we 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 become attached to our belief systems, like uh, an infant becomes attached to a breast. You know, don't take this away from me. I'm going to die. I'm going to die if you take it away from me. And I'm going to defend my life over it. I'm going to go out and buy a, a, an assault rifle. I'm going to defend my life over it. Because I, I assume, even before I know for a fact, I assume there's a threat against my, my label. And the assumption becomes the reality that there's this threat against my label. So I have to be in this constant state of this defensive state all the time. And we become locked in this defensive state all the time. And then lo and behold, the reality becomes, it becomes a reality. Eight people get shot in, in, in Atlanta, four people get murdered in Boulder, Colorado. Every day and every day around the corner from me, you go down to Bed-Stuy or East New York, some, some poor mother is uh, mourning over the death of her five-year-old son who gets shot by a stray bullet. You know, and then we create this reality, not consciously, and not purposefully out of this assumption that there's somebody out to get me and take something away from me. And we explain everything in terms of that ideology. Yeah. 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 Uh, and which is, I think, what Tyler uh, was saying, that we, right. uh, we explain it inside of the ideology. Uh, yeah. And that the ideology maybe separate from but I wonder if we can use the rest of our time if you have any questions of each other uh, as to other value issues that have come up inside of your early life. Uh, I, I thought we might end there. Uh, I mean, do you have questions? Uh, I have one. Uh, I mean, do you think do you think of the other side as not having values? Do you or, want me to answer that one? Uh, oh, any of us, yeah. Get Tyler, sure. Uh, 
I see a lot of this fight happening on the left, if that makes sense. Yeah, I know that my perspective is biased. I, I totally get that. But what I mean by that is I see a lot of people partitioning themselves into little groups because they don't want to hear counter thought. Like the idea that you wouldn't listen to someone that's conservative. Well, how can you better strengthen your position if you're not willing to listen to potential flaws in your logic or to reinforce your logic by listening to their failures? I'm a massive proponent of free speech. I think that it's ridiculously important so that one, you can say something stupid and get corrected. And two, you can listen to someone say something stupid and help correct them. And I think one of the biggest issues that is the most damaging is the idea of cancel culture. Oh, they, that one person text messaged something back in 1853. So they're a bad human and we shouldn't ever talk to them again. I, I, I think that right there is the core of the problem. This idea that we shouldn't give people we don't like airtime. I think it's clear every one of us are anti, um, anti white supremacy, anti KKK. We should still listen to what they have to say. And here's why I was a probation officer for a long time and I was put in charge of the sex offender registry. And some of the most horrific crimes against humanity, I would say, I, I witnessed at the hands of the people that I had to deal with. One man was a pedophile who knew the thing that he was struggling with and he was struggling within the court system to get himself surgically neutered in, in case yeah surgically surgically infertile because he realized the pain that it caused and it took me from this position of hating him for what he was born as to feeling sorry for him because it's a horrible situation to be in and for me personally, looking in the mess, I have empathy for people and I want them to see my perspective. And I personally only think that's gonna happen with conversations like this. And I, I know any of our friend Alice's friends that are very extremely liberal, I've offered every one of them to talk to me on the phone. I'm happy to give them my time, not because I'm gonna convince them of anything, but only because I want them to understand why I'm thinking the way that I'm thinking, but I also want to know why they think that as well. If I can hear though, do you, I mean, I mean, do you have questions of anyone else here? Yeah, I have a, not clarification on. I have a question for Tyler uh, about something he just said, and 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 it's you know, you started off saying that it's the liberals, and we were describing a character characterizing something about um, not listening, not doing this and that. And, and, uh, and then I thought you were giving a tr tr great definition of what it means to be a progressive liberal. You know, and, and I was just wondering, you know, uh, uh, where that split ha happened, you know, if, if you experience, for me, I experienced it as a split in the way in your, in your th thought process, but for starting off, you know, it's, it happens so much on the left side with the cancel culture and not giving. And, and I think we have to understand that on the left side, when you're, if you're talking about Black Lives Matter, you know, not wanting someone to speak at a university, this, it, that, that is so packed with so many microaggressions that Black people have had to deal with for centuries in this country. And all of a sudden, they're starting to feel like they have some voice and some power. And hey, man, you know, what comes around goes around. For years, they were told to shut up. For years, they were told they couldn't talk, they couldn't speak, that they weren't worth listening to. And so, so but, but it's just this notion that it's the left, people on the, the liberal left who don't want to listen. Now, I said before that I agree with that to some extent because I've had that debate with some people on the far left and the left where I am uh, about that very thing. You don't want to listen. You don't want to listen. And, but I think, you know, from the left side, I can say that my experience is exactly the same when I, when I read and I listen to people, not conservatives, because I think we have to make a different, we have to make a, some kind of definition here between what we call conservative and what we call a right winger, you know, a far right winger, you know, extremist, that 
I don't see anyone there trying to willing to listen. I don't see anyone there listen. And I see a lot of cancel culture on the right too. You know, Coca Cola has no right to speak up about what happened in Georgia. Delta Airlines has no right. We're not going to put. We're not going to donate any more money to. You know, we're, whatever. We're not going to. We're going to boycott them for speaking their mind, for speaking what they believe in. So, and that's just an example of it. Hillary Clinton should be locked up, thrown away. You know, so this cancel culture things. I think it goes back to something we've been talking about. It's just something we're all doing, all canceling each other out all the time. Uh, and and I mean, it's been clear on taxes. It's been clear on guns. It, it's almost as if one group says, here's my new value system. Anyone in the other group sucks big time. And my group is good. And when does that happen? And I, I hope it hasn't happened to the four of us, but uh, some of it, I think, permeates our skin, like going into a smoke-filled room. Uh, and stays with us. That idea that the other is a monstrosity, that mm. you know, a communist or a fascist, right? Everybody's a communist or a fascist nowadays. Uh, everything is communism. Everything is fascism. Um, I, I mean, are we just about labels? Is this like athletic chauvinism where Packers, fucking Packers are the best. And anybody else it was at a ball game, somebody, a Phillies game, somebody was drunk in front of me and my granddaughter. And he said, anybody says anything good about uh, Pujols who was playing for, for St. Louis, I'm going to bust their face. And my granddaughter said, can we leave? <laughs> you know, we did. We made it through the first half of the first inning and she wanted out of there and she was a middle teenager she wasn't a baby or something but uh I, is it any different than athletic chauvinism i don't want to hog i don't want to hog so i'll make this very quick the distinction between the communist and the fascist is like me looking in the mirror what we what we call communism and how we think about these two terms is like me looking at myself in the mirror the right looks at the left as communist they want to take over everything be in control of everything and to top down all their ideology on us. And the left looks at the right as fascists. They want to take over, they want to top down, and they want to control everything and top down their ideology on us. And these words, again, what Susan was saying before, they're words and they're powerful, but we've lost the nuance of these words. And that's what makes it so hard to talk about. You know, I guess for me, <clears throat> I'm, as, I, as I get older, I, I'm less a talker. And uh, instead of trying to figure it all out, you know, I just go back to what I started with, um, you know, when we started this, which is just do the work and uh, sit down with people. And, uh, you know, I, I was active for a while with a group called the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom. And it was an effort to bring Muslim and Jewish women together. And basically, we had a group of 20 people, like 10 Jews, 10 Muslim women. We got together at each other's homes. Maybe this is a woman thing. We made dinner together and talked. And, you know, that's, and the one topic we were not allowed to talk about was Israel-Palestine. So we left that, we left those labels aside, but, you know, we just, we really engaged. And, um, and the work that I do now is I am an ESL teacher and I work with immigrants. And I work with people from all over the world with very different views of what it means to be an American and what it means to live the American dream. So, but I guess what I'm saying is I just, I, I don't talk so much anymore because it gives me a headache and, you know, <laughs> I, I'm just not interested, but I, I just, I just try to get in there and, and just, you know, do the work. So here's the question for the last five minutes. Do we dare come together and actually talk about policy issues and find out how we feel, how we feel about policy issues? And, and not just our thinking about it, but how we feel about these things as human beings and how our, our lives with our grandfathers, with our... Uh, uh, our grandmothers and our grandmothers cooking, how all of that influenced 
how we end up thinking. Are we willing to actually uh, uh, take that next step or should we stop here while we're ahead? You know? <laughs> what do you think? I don't care if I care if I address that one. You bet. I'm fine. No. I have I have long, long belie believed that people on the right and the left identify the exact same problem. Like Neil just said, they use different words, but they're talking about the exact same thing. The conflict comes in trying to rectify those problems. They have different ideas on what will fix those problems. The reality, in my opinion, is that both the left and the right have viable solutions, but they need each other. I, I, I personally see the left and the right like Spock and Captain Kirk. <laughs> too much logic is a problem. Too much emotion is a problem. Too much logic is uncaring. Too much emotion just completely misses the second and third order of effects. When you do this, this is going to happen, and then this, and then this, and then this, and not in a slippery slope way, but in just a logical, if we do this, that's going to happen. And I think that's the conflict, and I think it's a beautiful thing. And if we can talk with these people that we don't agree with, we can sit back and go, oh, I was being too logical. That was unkind of me. Or we can sit back and say, Oh, I was thinking with pure emotion. I had no idea that I would create this huge problem because I wasn't being logical about it. Uh -huh. I love talking about this little fish tank. Uh, do you think you can bring me back <laughs> and talk about these things? Uh, I, I'm not talking about solving the problem, and I'm certainly not talking about convincing anyone else of the failure in their uh, way of thinking. I'm talking about actually learning how the other person thinks about these things. And, and there are things like immigration and guns and abortion. And uh, I'm sure we have four different views on most of these things. And I'm wondering if we, uh, <laughs> sorry about this, Susan. I wonder if we have the balls to, uh, <laughs> to kind of sit down and try to understand the other person. Yeah. I, I love talking to people and I love talking to people that don't have the same opinion as me. I'm not gonna guarantee I agree, but I love listening to what their ideas are because it forms and shapes mine. So what I'm saying is absolutely, even if it's, even if you guys wanted to talk to me offline, I would say I'm always open. Here it's kind of interesting because we have a frame within yeah. which uh, to work, and uh, if we go offline, we're all kind of, I agree. of issues. But here we can actually examine, and Alice can afterwards analyze with her Freudian analytic wand and and going over magically and figuring out what everything means as she's so skilled at doing. Alice, are you listening? I hope so. I, th I, think it, I think it's also important that we consider that not just talking about how we, you know, our differences, but how we feel, how we feel, what we feel and what we're sensing when we get into a disagreement. Yeah. Not about the disagreement itself, but what we're feeling and sensing, how it affects, how it affects me when I hear something that doesn't sit well with me. I had more anxiety as I was beginning this and while we were waiting to come in than I have had during this meeting. Yeah. I felt a lot of anxiety or a lot of sense that this was going to go to shit. Uh, it, it felt okay. Uh, but I'd like to come back and we have to stop in one minute, I think. So what say ye? I'm back. Good. Oh, good. Let's come back in a week and uh, and not take the gloves off, but really try to understand because my own set says that we're at least convinced that we're all decent people. Mm. Never Maybe. Susan's decent. <laughs> Balls have their place, you know, they're decent. <laughs> I'm sorry, I grew up on the streets of Brooklyn and my first English me... words were not sweet. Uh, I grew up speaking uh, a Yiddish, Aramaic, and Hebrew, and nobody was speaking Aramaic that was alive anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to the dead. 
Bye-bye. Bye. Okay.